Hello, my name's Lizzie Harper and today in response to a lot of requests from you guys who are good enough to watch my YouTube videos, um, I'm doing some real time just drawing of a specimen in pencil onto the page. Um, various people have asked me over the years how to do how I do that. Um, so the specimen I'm doing is something I have to illustrate for the Brecknockshire Flora, which is a project I'm working on, and it's the U. So I've just been out just now and bought and bought and bought anything, and picked up various sprigs of the U tree, um, and I'm going to be drawing those for you today. Uh, so yeah, so hopefully if you sit with me, then I'll talk you through the process of how about how I go about doing a pencil drawing of a um, of a plant, just a botanical illustration. Um, there won't be any colour in this video, it literally is just going to be me drawing the pencil uh, picture for you guys. So, first thing to do, get a piece of paper. This one I've had to measure up because this is for a specific purpose for this um, Brecknock flora and the specimen. So the one I'm going to be drawing is this little bit of you here. Um, and you can see it's in flower. These little, these little things here are the flowers, which will eventually turn into the yew berries. So that's useful because it tells me where the yew berries are going to be. I've even found in the churchyard, I don't know if you can see that, maybe you can't, one yew berry, which is still there. I mean, the seed is about to come out of the, um, about uh, to come out of the fleshy cup, the arrow. But that's useful for me as well. Um, so I've got backup reference as well. And I know the space that the picture is going to go in. So the next thing to do is just really to get started. Tools of the trade, as well as the specimen that I'm going to be drawing, um, which is the European U from the churchyard across the way, which is uh, Taxus Baccata. I've also got a nice rubber, which I like these ones. This is a Tri-24 Factis. And the pencil I use, I love mechanical pencils. And this one is an 0.5 millimeter lead pencil P205. I think it's an HB, I'm not entirely sure. So, what do you do to start with? You've got your, you've got your specimen and you've got your piece of paper. And after you're prevaricated for a while, the first thing to do is with the lightest of touches, and again, I'm not 100% certain this is gonna show up because this is pencil, is to plot what you're looking at. So I'm literally, looking at the specimen now and drawing a very very pale pencil line so that bit there is about the same as the bit that's branching upwards a very thin pencil line to represent where the illustration is going to go that goes up there up to the top of that box i don't think it matters if it overlaps the box a tiny bit my client said that wasn't a problem that comes down there and this bit here branches off quite early it branches off like that so there we are that really is the very very beginning <clears throat> just the lightest of lines you don't want to make these lines too hard because then they're hard to rub out and they'll ruin the picture but it's a map it's a map and you double check i then will take this double check literally these are just very basic calculations that is it the same length as that more or less and then on my picture yeah, OK, so we're basically in the right ballpark. So that means we're ready then to move on to the details. OK, so details. Let's hope I don't get my hair under the camera like I normally do. Um, I'm going to start here. Where am I starting? Just here. And I just go in and start drawing. So literally, I'm looking at that one. And one pine, one not pine needle, goodness me. Um, that one U needle, and plotting it in. Now I know that the leaves of the U are flattened, and they are needle-like, and they're arranged in two rows, or kind of like almost like a spiral. And they have these petioles, which are these little um, stalks. Now there's all sorts of things you can do when you're drawing to make life easier. First start somewhere and make sure that you do actually draw what you see rather than what you think you see because then you will be able to come back if you get lost for any reason you'll be able to come back and figure out what you were drawing. What was I drawing? Whereabouts in the picture was I? There's that petiole again. 
and of course they're different sizes these leaves because some curl up towards you a little and some don't and then on we go up the yew branch oh come on pencil work for me okay that's there maybe if i pull this into shot that might help a bit let's see but yeah that is in shop you can't quite see the bit that i'm doing never mind doesn't really matter okay so that bit there this bit comes like this so you need to look at the specimen all the time because you can't just be like oh well i know what it looks like now that's fine game over i'll just redo that all the time because each and every that curves each and every needle is an individual leaf right so because of the environmental pressures on it and because of the wind and because of who knows what they're all slightly different shape and they curve slightly differently and it's this individuality that will make the plant look like a plant rather than like a pastiche of itself okay off we go here and this one here we've got one of these leaves and it's coming sideways doing it's going down like that and I'm putting these mid ribs in again partly because it makes it more realistic and also because they're there but also I like to put them in early on so they don't have to keep coming back okay there's a kind of ridge on this branch here and I can't see the petiole here it's hidden by the branch so you need to respect that and this one so I've got that little triangle there, that triangle of negative space. Oh, golly. Okay, and twisting out. And that's, you can see a sharp tip on the tip of that one. And that's because of the angle that it's coming out at. I've drawn that slightly wrong, but it's okay. I'll always be able to paint it over. The paper I'm using is Fluid 100. If I was just doing a pencil drawing, I wouldn't be using that. But the reason why I'm using it is um hold on one two three one two three there is one here i thought there was um the reason i'm using it is because this is going to be watercolored eventually it's going to have color over the top of it for the flora so i'm drawing direct this is this is what i will hopefully um end up coloring in putting the watercolor onto in due course okay they've got those there that's there now we've got two of these here and are these yeah so that's that one and this one comes in behind so you see that's what i mean you draw it in and if you get it right then you keep getting these feelings of assurance it's like oh well that is right or clearly that's right because when i plot that in yes that that leaf that i've already drawn is where it needs to be excellent that's lucky okay so that's that now we're going to come up here where are we so we've got that and we're above this little triangle it's not perfect but it's perfect enough um, okay so this is on this side and this one comes curving over the u branch like that that's nice that's fine and so out of all that i do the actual drawing is the hardest bit it has to be said i have to concentrate quite hard and actually talking at the same time as drawing is quite a challenge uh, that one does that. hang on what's going on here we've got a little triangle I oh, said so there's another one coming here out here uh, so what another thing I do a lot of when I'm drawing that point there I've got to make sure we record that correctly down to the petiole um, a lot of what I do when I'm drawing is look for the negative spaces which is the spaces between things so the leaves are the positive space and these white areas between the leaves are known as the negative space and they are very useful when you're drawing because the U comes up like this, that's all fine, and then that comes down like that. Um, because your mind thinks it knows what a leaf looks like, so you have you have um, a preconceived idea of what you're drawing. Whereas if you're drawing these spaces between the leaves, these white spaces, your mind doesn't necessarily know what you're expecting it to draw. It's like, well, I haven't got a picture in my mind for the space between leaves, so I'm really going to have to concentrate and observe. And that ends up often with the result that the 
when you use these negative space areas, it's a much more honest, um, it's a much more honest depiction of what you're looking at. It's much more realistic. Okay, that's tricky because those are exactly the same tone. That's fine. And this one comes over the top of it. Now, it does have to be said with drawing like this, possibly, hello little spider, there's a little spider in amongst my you. Um, quite possibly the reason why I'm quite confident just drawing straight in this way is because I do it an awful, awful lot. So it's like anything. Drawing is like anything, you know, it's down to practice. So the more you draw, the more you're going to be able to do this stuff and get it right without panicking. Uh, what I would suggest if you do feel anxious, sorry, I've just bodged the camera. Where am I? I'm here, aren't I? Um, what I would suggest if you do feel anxious about getting the shapes right, do more of that plotting instead of just putting where those main branches are. Plot in the edges of where the needles reach to or, you know, gen general, very, very light shapes. Block them in. That's all OK. I mean, there's no right and wrong, right? When you come to drawing, it's not like you're going to make a mistake. I mean, if you make a mistake, you can always rub it out. But there's no such thing as cheating. So whatever works for you is good. As long as it gets you drawing, I don't care what you do. I don't think there's any, you know, I've written blogs about this. I'm quite passionate about it. The idea that sometimes people tell you that you're cheating when you're drawing. You are not cheating when you're drawing. Whatever methods you use to get it right, to make it work for you, if it means that you end up picking up a pen and drawing something, then if you ask me, it's not cheating. After all, all the greats, you know, Leonardo used camera obscura and all that kind of stuff. Good enough for Leonardo. It's good enough for me. So yeah, never feel hung up about cheating, please. It's it's silly. Okay, so this one comes out like this, and it's on a twist, so it's more laterally elongated. And you can see that my guide things, I'm sort of sticking to them, but I'm not sticking to them religiously because I'm trusting my eye more than I'm trusting those original guides. They were to give me a suggestion of where the thing needed to land on the page. These ones are slightly annoying because they're all sideways. I'm actually going to alter this one, even though it does go sideways. I'm going to make it slightly broader just for the composition. No, that doesn't actually line up, which is unfortunate. OK. Uh, right, OK, and then we're continuing up here. The other thing I'd say is if you wear glasses, I never used to, but I do now when it comes to drawing stuff. If you wear glasses, make sure that your glasses are clean before you start drawing something that's quite complicated. Otherwise, you just end up being irritated by the blurs, which are everywhere. So this here leaf here, I don't know if you can see on the film, is this one coming across like this. And now we're about to hit the little flowers, which have just come out actually in the last couple of weeks. And as I say, I am going to plot them in, but the reason why I'm plotting them in, I'm not drawing this. What the heck is happening here? What are you doing? You're far too wide. That's so annoying. Um, I have no intention of leaving these in as flowers. But if I position them in, then they will give me a very good idea of where, in due course, in the autumn, the yewberries will come. Because obviously... The yew berries will grow where the flowers are, although now I'm having a panic because I know that they're sexually dimorphic. So perhaps the flowers are just going to produce the pollen. And the seed will be elsewhere. So this is a difficult thing when you're drawing things that are slightly out of season. So if, if I were to wait for these yew trees to come back into berry, um, then I absolutely would not hit any deadline and the client would just be like, why are you not drawing anything? But at the same time, you do need to remember that it's always the easiest thing to do is to draw something that is actually as it is. So drawing this you right now is in no way problematic for me. But when it comes to plotting in the berries, it is going to be problematic because I'm kind of going to have to invent it to a certain extent based on what knowledge of you anatomy I may or may not have. So 
so yeah so that one goes up there this one comes behind it so again making sure we have these petioles in so this is a european ewe from my graveyard from my graveyard Ooh. from the graveyard opposite my house i have a beautiful church opposite my house in Helmway. and hang on i need to concentrate what's the relationship between this and these this over here we have that one coming around like that okay that's fine um and you'll often find yew trees in graveyards in european countries and there's various reasons for this one is because yews were a very useful source of timber yew tree timber is got a very fine it grows very slowly so it's got a very fine grain it's incredibly strong um and waterproof as well all of these things obviously make it a very valuable timber it's a sort of beautiful rose rosy red color um okay what's that doing that one's there that one's there so we're now to this one And in the olden days, it was used to make weapons, specifically bows. And I don't know if any of you have heard, well, I'm sure you have, you're, you're a bright airy, you died a bunch. I don't know if you've heard of Otzi, who is a, it was a sort of a mummified corpse, I guess, found ages ago in the Tyrolean Alps. And... On closer exam examination, the archaeologists found out that actually Otzi had been there for three and a half thousand years, which is extraordinary. And one of the things he was carrying with him was a bow made from you from you wood. So it's very flexible and it's very strong, so it's very good for bows. Um, and all through all through history, certainly in Britain, yew trees have been used to make bows. Um, it goes like that. But yew trees are extremely toxic, not only to man but also to other mammals. So you would not want any yew trees. One, two, three, one. This one comes up here. Um, where's that? That? That one's that one. So we have another one that bends around. So you wouldn't want any yew trees growing on your pasture land or where you're grazing flocks of sheep or cows because they'd be very likely to kill the sheep or sheep or cows um i think i think i read that 50 to 100 grams 50 to 100 grams i wrote it down because it was so surprising 50 to 100 yeah 100 grams of chopped yew leaves would kill a human adult so they're really really toxic stuff so you really don't want your your sheep and goats and and, and cows grazing on that stuff um so where can you put it where grazing doesn't happen ah churchyards nobody has grazing animals in churchyards so that is one reason why yew trees are often in churchyards there's another reason as well which is because the yew is such an extraordinary and peculiar tree people have always um had quite a strong spiritual you see this comes up here which is exactly where it is so that's gratifying um people have always had a strong spiritual connect connection with it like way back pre-christianity times and often what happened was when christianity came to britain churches would be built on holy sites sites that had been sacred long long before anybody had started talking or spreading christianity or any of that stuff um and the yew trees, in most cases actually, predate predate the churchyard. Uh, so again, it's to do with it's to do with the tree being regarded over history as kind of sacred and special. I'm not I'm not that hippy dippy, but I do quite like it. I like the fact that there's this continuity of respect for this plant, and in many many different religions. Uh, you is kind of associated with death, but not in a bad way. It's not like a tree of death or anything. 
It's just, I think, because it's often in churchyards and stuff, and this is across many religions. This isn't, oh, that's rubbish. This isn't just Christianity. Um, it's regarded as, as the guardian or the gatekeeper, the guardian of the gates to the other world or to death. I'm going to move this now. There we go. So it's a tree to sort of respect, but not to fear. Okay, that one comes down like that. And there's one part, there is one part of the U, which is in no way toxic. And that is the little red fleshy cup that surrounds the seeds that come in autumn. And the seeds are called, it's called the aril. And this little fleshy scarlet cup is not toxic. And in fact, birds, especially thrushes and blackbirds and things, members of the thrush family. What's happening here? That's turning around the corner and this is coming up. Like that. Um... They absolutely love it. And because there's quite a lot of them through the winter on the trees, they're a very important and valuable food source to these birds. Um, but as I say, I mean, for, for human beings, do not, even though they aren't toxic, do not go around eating the red fleshy parts of a ewe seed. Some people have got quite ill from doing that. I did have, I still have, a friend who, when our kids were toddlers, kind of almost show off by feeding her child the red bit around a yew berry. It always used to make me, and I'm, I'm quite tough about this stuff, but it always used to make me very nervous. However, to his credit, the child was never poorly, so she probably knew what she was doing. But don't, generally, just don't. Um, yeah, that comes down like that. Now, although the yew is poisonous, it's also really important currently in medical science. And I would imagine a lot of you know. I've messed that up really badly. Yeah, so I was just saying that yew trees are important for current medical science. So Taxol is an anti-cancer drug. Which is really important, I think, especially in fighting breast cancer, although I'm not sure about that. Right. I'm not quite sure what happened just then. My video filled up, so I've probably lost my train of thought completely. And this is interesting. Well, possibly. Um, so here, this is where I've laid out the line. And now I'm drawing it. That line's going up there. Now, slightly problematic because of this, the confines of this box. So I'm now going to slightly adjust my specimen, the U, so that it's it's not going to it's not going to follow that exact thing, but it's still going to stay within the box. And I'm redrawing that light line so that we end up still more or less where my composition suggested. So do keep an eye on all that kind of stuff. It is it's important. Um, what else was I going to tell you? I've got no idea what I was going to tell you anymore. One, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, I don't even know where I am anymore. I've got lost. Got lost in the it lost in the plant. That happens quite often. Have I drawn? Hang on, hang on. What have I drawn and what have I not drawn, peeps? So I've drawn that. Is this this? Down here, we've got those two crossovers. Yeah, okay, and so we've stopped here. Okay, you know what? I'm going to keep going with this branch. Let me move this so that you'll be able to see. I'm going to keep going with this branch because I'm getting confused, which is no good at all. Okay, so there and there and there. And like I say, I've got no idea what I was just saying, so I'm sure that I've totally lost my train of thought. Now, I know we were mentioning cancer drugs and the poisonousness of yews and crossbows and who knows what else. Okay, so here, as I'm drawing, I can see these are coming over the top, you see, so I'm leaving these as little spaces in my drawing. Again, that's to do with playing with, well, not playing with, using negative space to do the hard work for you. And then I can put these in behind. They're quite long, these ones. And then again, there's all this going on up above. And hopefully when I draw that in, I'll be able to plop those in without too much trouble. Again, this is another of the cone zones. Cone zone. Uh, ah, this is tricky, man. Okay. That 
comes across like that. There we go. It's a relationship between things. That's what drawing really is, is recording the relationship between things. And with plants and leaves, that's really what you're spending a lot of time looking at. How one leaf is attached to the stem, how it relates to the other leaves, all of that kind of stuff. There we go, that goes over there, that's better. Now I'm not going to feel quite so confused. And that goes up here. Uh, what I'm tempted to do now, possibly, is to pause the video and just keep going for a little bit and then come back when it's done. Otherwise, you're going to have an hour of me just drawing. Well, maybe that's what you want. I mean, that's what people have said they wanted. It seems even more extreme than you guys watching paint dry, <laughs> which I'm so gratified that you like to do because that's what I spend my life doing as well. Um, but yeah, drawing, you're just looking all the time. So there's a rule of thumb. I think I will just keep drawing to camera, actually. Um, there's a rule of thumb, which is that when you look, when you're drawing, this is what my mum said. My mum's still with us, but she's not very well anymore. Um, but she always used to say when I was, she was a fine artist. She was used to say when I was little, when you're drawing something, look at it 80% of the time and look at your page, what you're busy drawing. 20% of the time. So I try and stick to that because it's quite a good rule of thumb. So a lot of time I'll be drawing and I'm not really looking at my pencil at all. I'll sort of double check to see where the pencil is leading, but I'm not I'm not busy looking at, at, at my drawing and I'm certainly not involved in worrying what my drawing is looking like. Oh gosh, I can't be asked with that. Um, it's much more to do with looking, observing, looking, and trying to record what you see in the relationships between the things that you see. Uh, that little thing here. Is that little one there? Yeah, that little one there. He's a little one. And then this here comes out like that. That's really long. Really long. It's weird. These are all, I would have thought that they're all the same length, all the same size, but they're not. Some are much longer than others, clearly. Okay, that's a, a needle. There we are. And here at this end up here. I've got that. Well, how much is that? Where's the tip of that? Is it hidden? No, it is hidden. Well, that's not very useful. That doesn't make visual sense. So I'm going to just plop that in there so that we know what we're doing. Um, yeah, putting in the berries is going to be interesting because that's going to be adding something which is basically nowhere around it it's basically fiction it's going to be fiction because the bear the berries aren't here and now actually when it comes to the biology the botany of the tree i'm sitting here thinking i know that they're sexually dimorphic so if this is producing flowers which it is then this is a male tree, and therefore that won't give me any clues as to the distribution of the berries, which is what I was kind of hoping it would do, but I didn't think when I was there with my scissors in the churchyard. Okay. So there's almost no point in plotting them in, but I will, because they're there. They're very pretty little structures, aren't they? They're lovely. That'd be worth getting a, getting a microscope on, a dissecting microscope on, to see what's going on in amongst the intricacies of these flowers that are producing pollen which will be dispersed by the wind wind pollinated now sometimes it's worth double checking to make sure you're not making things much bigger so these are these mm, okay these are slightly bigger than down there but not noticeably so so sometimes you get carried away especially if i'm interested by something i get more carried away by it and then you end up in a position where you've changed scale so you do need to be a bit careful of that so these are still on this one. Yeah, okay. And this here comes mm. ah, this isn't gonna work. I've gone too far. Okay, I'm gonna have to put some extra bits in here. See, it's not all plain sailing. Sometimes you have to lie. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a couple of extra bits in here. 
And based on what is here, I'll just draw different bits that I can see again in the hope that the viewer will not be able to see that I've messed up my positioning. And biologically, I know that this, you know, elongating this branch a tiny bit isn't really problematic at all. It could be perfectly possible. Um, so the yew tree, what can I tell you about the yew tree? It's a funny old thing. It's um, it's classed as a conifer, but conifer means cone-bearing. And as we've already discussed with the arils and the red fleshy berries, the yews don't bear cones, they bear these seeds hidden in the heart of these fleshy berries. And so that's quite awkward, actually. Um, they also, which I found out today when I was looking into it, they don't produce resin, which again, I think is probably something that most conifers do. I mean, certainly if I think about handling pine cones and 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 also, you know, timber and stuff, there's always all the sort of pines and the spruces and Christmas trees very sticky with the resin and the yew doesn't. And I think it's classed as a, it is however classed as a conifer. So that's that. So now we can move this way up here. And it goes behind the next one and it's hidden. And we can see the petiole here. There we go. Um, and the way they grow, yews are amazing, right? So they're very, very slow growing and very long lived. So nobody really knows, I'll tell you why they don't really know, but nobody really knows how old the oldest ewes are, but they think they, you know, certainly there's some records of ewes that have grown that are over one and a half thousand years old. And some people who know a lot about this kind of stuff suggest that they may well they may well live to um to at least okay sorry i'm still trying to establish my relationships here and um, they think that they that some may easily live till about 2000 or 3000 years old it's not impossible so they're very slow growing which is why the grain is so tight um and uh, they have a weird way of hollowing out their trunks so they'll grow and then the wood the heartwood will rot away and leave a hollow trunk and into this hollow trunk the you will often send sort of tender little root little roots and the roots will grow through the sort of the powdery rotten heartwood and end up hitting the ground eventually within the within the husk of the of the yew tree i suppose and then they will start to grow and be another tree trunk. So you'll often have a younger tree trunk growing within the shell of an older tree trunk. Um, and the hollow tree trunks are pretty cool because, yeah, that's all right. Um, the hollow tree trunks are pretty cool because they actually are quite flexible. So if you have a hollow tube, any engineer will tell you a hollow tube is more flexible in winds and things, I believe, than a um, than a solid tube. That's not the tip here, is it? Is that the tip? No, what's happened here? There, that, there, that's there. That's that. Yeah, there's this one here. I thought it didn't look quite right. That's more like it. Whoops. Right, so I know as a fact, I don't know how long this bit of video is, but I know now we're probably on about 50 minutes and I still haven't finished drawing my U. So the other thing I would say when you're drawing is do not be surprised if it takes you flipping ages, because it will do. Um, I'm now going to pause this and plot in the rest of the needles. And then when I come back, I'll talk about putting those U berries in. So you can see that I've, um, I've put in a lot of the berries already. I've finished doing the illustrating of the U all the way up here. Uh, 
and I've already plotted in a lot of the berries. Now, I know that the berries grow in the axils of the leaves, which means where the leaves join the branches. So I've plotted those in. I've also, to back up the actual specimens, I've been using um, photo ref that I get from all sorts of sources on the internet. Um, it's important if you're using photo ref, never just copy it, partly because sometimes photos or illustrations misrepresent um, a specimen but also you can't just copy something because that's copyright infringement which is illegal um, yeah but this is very useful for me figuring out kind of the distribution of the berries along the branches now I know from looking at those and also from personal observations over the years that the main branch of EU you're going to have less of the berries and then on these these secondary branches they're much more heavily laden um, my concern is that I've drawn the berries too small. I'm going to have to check that with my um, with a client who's commissioned these, but I'm sure he'll let me know if they have. I'm just here putting in a couple more berries. So a lot of the berries are face on. So this one is coming out of the axil just here. And literally it's just that kind of shape. And then they tend to they tend to form opposite one another in kind of pairs if you where well, was a good illustration to show that? Here, this one here. So you can see here that they just sort of tend to form opposite one another. So I'll be using that. Um, and then just put in the other one. Again, just drawing the shape. And that kind of, oh, that was wrong. And that half circle, that C shape, suggests the top of the curve of the fleshy red arrow. And in some cases, such as here, you'll be able to see the seed, <coughs> the seed within. And you might here be able to see the top of the seed. And then pop back in the, pop back in the, um, the lines of the leaves that have been erased. So there we are. That's it, really. So, yeah, so I've made this video in response to a request, which was basically you do real-time videos of how to paint but what about how to draw i hope the pencil has shown up for you and i hope it has given you some kind of idea <clears throat> of how i go about doing things but i would absolutely that doesn't look right um i would absolutely stress that just being able to pick up a pencil and draw is something like anything like speaking a foreign language or oh, i don't know doing maths or anything it's something that comes with practice. So the more you do it, the better you'll be able to do it. But until then, use background shapes, use light pencil marks, plot out what you're doing. Um, and for me, certainly drawing in very clear, crisp, single lines of pencil is the best way to draw. Um, and with pencil, of course, you make a mistake, you can use a rubber and you can fix it. So, yeah, this has been an illustration of the U, which is Taxus baccata which is a, a common plant, a common tree across, across the world, across the globe, really important both in folklore um, and also in sort of in defence history and for human usages, but an amazing and an interesting plant. So hopefully this drawing process has helped you um, see how I do the drawings. And thank you very much for spending time with me this morning. Right, so it's a couple of hours later, isn't it? So I've done, I've finished that illustration of the U, which I know you've got a better view of in the earlier films. A um, couple of points. Don't be surprised by how long it takes to draw something. I mean, I even edited out part of this process of literally just drawing a U tree sprig, and it's still taken about two hours, three hours to do. It takes ages. Um, and also, it's quite difficult. You, you probably will when you're doing drawing you'll probably be quite tired at the end of it because you're concentrating really really hard on looking and seeing and transcribing that information from two dimensions uh transcribing the information from three dimensions into two dimensions so flattening it uh all i can say is just just keep at it the more you do it the better you'll get um practice makes perfect and just have respect for the form and the morphology of the plant you're looking at Draw what you actually see rather than what you think is probably there. Um, use background markings to guide you to start with. And just enjoy it. The main thing is enjoy it. Um, 
just have fun using a pencil to record something very, very beautiful that we find in nature. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to watch this video with me and hopefully it's been of use, especially to those of you who specifically requested it. Thank you then. And if you want to see more of my work and my finished work, do visit my website, which is lizzieharper.co.uk. Um, oh, and like and subscribe. You meant to say that if you've got a YouTube channel, aren't you? <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye.